This week's installment of the Series Security Seminar. Uh, our speakers today are two Purdue alumni who have returned to campus. Sharon Chan, who is the, who's a director, and Chad Whitman, who's a manager, and both work with Deloitte & Touche Security Practice. Welcome. Thanks, Joel, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come speak to the group today. Um, it's been quite a busy day. Uh, this was the industrial roundtable here at Purdue, and uh, both Chad and I had the privilege of being on campus for the last two days, and a chance to meet uh, what felt like thousands of Purdue students who uh, were just uh, fantastic to talk to and get to know a little bit about everybody's interests. So great to be back here and uh, excited to be talking with you today. Um, today we're going to spend some time talking about uh, trends in cybersecurity consulting. Um, both Chad and I have been in the um, security consulting industry, I think all our careers. I've been doing it for 17 years now and had a chance to work in a lot of different areas. And so I thought what we'd spend some time today is talking about some of the sort of leading trends that we're working with our clients on and a couple of examples around, of, uh, around cybersecurity consulting trends. So our agenda, I'll start with some overview comments on uh, some of the key cyber challenges and some kind of key data and research that uh, I found interesting. And then uh, we'll jump into two specific trends or case studies. I'm going to go through one on uh, integrated compliance risk management. And so that's how our clients are dealing with the struggle of complying with all these different types of regulations that are out there by different industries and sort of how they're managing that and setting up solutions and technology to address that. And then uh, Chad is going to walk through a case study or a, a real life example of a cyber incident and how uh, we helped the clients sort of through that process from beginning to end. Um, we have time in the back at the presentation for Q&A and open discussion, but I would certainly encourage anybody that has a question or a comment as we go through just to jump in. Um, would love to keep the session as interactive as possible. All right, so with that, I am going to um, jump right in and uh, start with some overview comments around uh, cyber challenges. And I want to start with this, this word cyber. Um, as a security professional, it took me a long time to become comfortable with the word cyber. You know, I sort of thought of it as this you know, foreign concept. I want to talk about information assurance and information protection, um, data security, privacy, confidentiality, availability, integrity. I mean, those are the kinds of concepts that I think sort of defines the information security profession. But what I found out, and I think uh, this is this is universal, a number of my, my colleagues at Deloitte as well, is in talking with the, the vast majority of the general public, as well as the vast majority of our corporate clients, those concepts are, are tough to grasp. If I tell somebody I'm an information security professional, sort of a, a glazed over look on their face. But if you talk about cyber security, people sort of now more intuitively understand what that means. And there's this whole discipline, I think, that's emerging in, in the practice around cyber security. I mean, some of these terms, cyber ethics, cyber bullying, cyber crime. I mean, I think that word has just started to coalesce a lot of activity out in industry, kind of with our corporate clients around what these concepts mean. Um, so I, I wanted to start with sort of use the term cyber consulting or cyber security consulting uh, purposefully rather than just information security or information assurance. I think everyone has seen slides like this. This is a headline slide that I pulled from a, a talk we did a few, a few months ago. And uh, the thing that I love about one of these headline slides is that you could do a new one almost every day, right? I mean, some of these are dated from 2011, some from 2010. But I, I think any given day, I could go and pull a new headline slide, right, of, of the different cybersecurity attacks or data privacy incidents that week. Um, so the world has definitely had its, its cyber wake-up call, right? I mean, there are issues out there. There's a lot of problems to solve. Um, you know, even with that and with these daily headlines that we could sort of reproduce anytime we want to, I think there are still so many challenges and, um, uh, that, that our you know, global security experts are still sort of struggling with, right? So this, uh, these statistics are from a study put out by the East-West Institute, which is a partnership between uh, corporate uh, consulting and governance, government organizations internationally to focus on um, some cybersecurity issues. And some of these statistics really jumped out at me. I mean, in sort of today's day and age, with the length of time that we've had focused 
people focusing in the information security profession, we still haven't made it very far in terms of sort of improving our overall cybersecurity position as a as a company, as a um, country. And so some of these statistics I thought were very interesting. Um, you know, over half of the folks surveyed didn't feel that their organization was capable of defending themselves against a cyber attack. Um, I think 70% or almost 70% doubted that their country could defend themselves effectively against a cyber, atta cyber attack. So, I mean, these are some really scary quotes and scary statistics out there I think helps to um, kind of build the business case about opportunities in cybersecurity consulting and the types of different projects that government, that corporate clients, private industry um, needs help from you know, professionals like you and the, the folks watching um, to help them address. So beyond some of those big, scary statistics, I want to talk about a couple of specific challenges that we see with, um, with folks trying to implement an overall cybersecurity program. And this is the type of thing that Deloitte will often do with our clients to sort of help them design an overall cybersecurity program. Um, some of these statistics are from, uh, are from Information Week, and uh, some are based on our, um, you know, they're sourced throughout here, some are based on our work as well. But if you kind of look across the life cycle of how do you maintain, how do you establish a cybersecurity program? Um, I just want to touch on a couple of the key highlights in, in here. One of the big challenges is, is governance and who's really going to be responsible for the program. Uh, you have folks with that information security title, whether it's CISO or you know, manager of information security. You've got chief risk officers, chief privacy officers, business unit leads with different responsibilities. So really defining that overall governance model is something that, um, you know, companies continue to struggle with. Um, you know, another key issue, and uh, one of the reasons I think we're so excited to be here today, is the lack of qualified professionals. I mean, still, even with um, phenomenal programs like the one that Purdue has, just overall in the marketplace, there is demand that cannot be met right now with the, the volume of candidates to um, you know, help further these cybersecurity issues. And I think that problem is really coming to a head for a number of uh, both industry companies as well as um, you know, public agencies. Um, you know, the point I'll draw our attention to is the uh, unintentional mishandling. I think as security professionals, we talk a lot about the insider threats and the importance of the insider threat. I think uh, an, of equal importance is considering the, the threat that may be posed by um, employees with, uh, with good intentions, right? They're, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to, you know, get their job done or get the business day, uh, get their business day accomplished. And they may do things sort of unintentionally that aren't causing or aren't um, leading to good security practices. So you know, your marketing manager emails her customer file home so she could finish working on it at night and by doing so exposes a bunch of PII, right? It's, it's an easy thing to have happen without sort of the proper education. So we still see that happening a lot across industry where this sort of unintentional mishandling can result in an incident that I really wouldn't classify as the insider threat. It's sort of well-meaning, um, well-intentioned employees that just maybe aren't trained on the right regulations they need to comply with and the right practices that they have to follow. <clears throat> the other thing I'll mention on here is uh, the financial implications. Um, Certainly are seeing a lot of work in industry right now around the financial implications of a breach and how to effectively sort of plan for that. Certainly we've seen security incidents that have um, you know, risen into you know, the eight figures for, for companies trying to get through resolving them by the time you think about penalties and fines, containment, and also just you know, implementing new programs and practices to, uh, to manage those. So just a, just a breadth of uh, challenges across the landscape of setting up a cybersecurity program. So with that, I'm going to jump into our first trend. Um, when we were uh, putting together the agenda for this, this talk, uh, sort of going through all the different opportunities in, uh, or all the different trends in cybersecurity consulting, and you know, I think there's literally uh, a couple of hundred different types of projects that we're, we're doing these days, whether it's vendor risk management or identity and access management or forensics were just so many different things. So rather than going through that long exhaustive list, we tried to pick um, two case studies that, that we go through today. So I'll jump into the first one now, and that's around uh, the concept of integrated compliance risk management. And, uh, and being consulting, we like to use a lot of acronyms, so I probably will refer to this as ICRM as we go through, but I'll, I'll try to watch myself on that. 
So what is, uh, what is ICRM, or Integrated Compliance Risk Management? Well, this is really a trend that we see um, across industries with our clients these days, and just this ongoing, increasing demand for IT compliance. You know, 10 years ago, it was, it was SOX controls and folks figuring out how they needed to comply with SOX controls. Then there are PCI controls that came out, and sort of now you've got that as a uh, standard that, that companies need to adhere to if, they, you know, if they've got the credit card information. But now by industry, there's just a plethora, plethora of different regulations that they've got to um, comply with. I mean, financial services has a massive set. Utility industry has a massive set. Nearly every industry has sort of their own definition of what their security requirements need to be for their critical assets. You know, add to that the, the data privacy laws that are different state by state in a lot of cases. It, you throw in a global company there that's got um, different regulations they need to meet in their different locations. Um, and then companies have their own internal policies they need to meet too. So they may have internal policies around data protection, around data notification, you know, all different sorts of things. Got to maintain compliance to those. They've got third-party relationships. So say you're a telecommunications company you know, building phones and you've got sourcing agreements from all sorts of different parties and reseller agreements with different parties and there are contractual agreement, contractual requirements in there on security. So now you've got that set of security requirements you have to manage. So there's just sort of this overwhelming um, replication of security requirements from so many different sources. And those are all managed by a whole bunch of different entities within the, your average company. Um, there's your IT organization, uh, may have dedicated compliance managers, internal audit, there are lines of business involved, um, legal is certainly involved. So it's this really kind of complicated web of compliance that um, I'd say most all companies are really struggling with it. how do I how do I manage this and still effectively stay in business? Um, so some of the key issues we see, costs and efficiencies, right? There's overlapping controls. There's um, you know, fines for, for non-compliance. There's a lot of over control too. So I'm going to go and put in a control to meet every single one of these individual requirements. And so I am way over controlled for the, the risk that I really have within my company. Um, you know, governance challenges too. People don't really have a sense for where their integrated risk is. There's no sort of integrated dashboarding around this. So just uh, you know, it causes a significant challenge. So as we're talking with clients about this challenge, I mean, what are some of the kind of key, key root, root causes that we see behind this? Um, one is that uh, you know, the different organi organizational functions really tend to view risks and their operations environments sort of differently. So if you think about within a, within a bank or even within a consumer products company, almost all, this almost applies across every industry. Every business unit or function is going to have a slightly different way of defining risk how they accept that risk, how they measure it, how they define their controls. And so all of those different silos are going to be kind of doing their own thing. Um, we also see a big root cause where compliance is uh, often confused with risk. So if I'm compliant, that means I'm safe. And that still is a challenge that I'd say a lot of business executives are struggling to sort of understand. What's the difference between complying with this regulation and if I do that, that means I'm 100% protected. And that certainly isn't the case. There's definitely an overlap between my compliance activities and compliance requirements helping to meet some of my overall information security requirements. But they are, um, you know, one just definitely does not equal the other. There's also really no single view of the overall IT security requirements. So as the board, as the senior executives within a company want to understand, you know, am I secure? Am I meeting all the requirements? That's a question that has to be answered by 15 different stakeholders. And all those different stakeholders are using different processes and different tools, which not only increases the time to get through everything, but the, the cost as well. Your, your cost to support all these different tools, increasing the chance for error. So some significant challenges there. So what's some practical pain relief? This is the problem. What are folks doing to actually address it? 
Um, one is a common requirements repository. So there's a lot of work going on across industry to look at common control frameworks that can rationalize down all of these different requirement sources into a common set of requirements that then I can establish controls off of. And we'll talk more about that. But it does uh, so common definitions for similar requirements. So if I have PCI requiring something and SOX requiring the same thing, I can have a single control to meet that requirement and then just apply those controls out to my two different environments for my credit card environment or my um, financial environment, excuse me. <coughs> um, the next area of uh, sort of pain relief that we see is in you know, rationalized uh, risk and control profiles. So a standards-based approach to develop what the controls are to meet all of those requirements. So you don't have one team uh, following ISO, another team following <coughs> IEC or NIST or COBIT, but a sort of standardized control rationalization approach. So as we define those requirements, we can easily map them to the required controls or the controls that, as a company, we've chosen to accept. <coughs> Um, the next facet then is that control level testing and reporting. So making sure as we define each control at the point where it's defined, we know exactly how it's going to be tested and measured. So that's upfront understanding what the evidence collection is, what the, um, the duration or life cycle of that control, is it quarterly, is it annual, and exactly how are we going to get down and measure compliance to that requirement. And then um, the last piece is really around enabling all this with technology. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but having this wonderful framework that maps requirements to controls to test procedures doesn't do us much good if it's on a spreadsheet, right? It needs to be in a system or a technology-enabled system that can really support the end users as they're going through this to, to automate the overall process. So I start talking a little bit about technologies, and I'll drill into that a little bit more. If you look at the technology space that's supporting this integrated compliance risk management challenge, now, even more so maybe two, three years ago, the technology solutions really fall into a couple of different silos. Um, or different categories. Um, there's a category of controls that really focus on sort of transaction surveillance and monitoring. So these are things that will do some active monitoring for controls or even active enforcement of controls, often within the financial environment, but within you know any of kind of the major business process areas. There's and, and so those are important, right? Because that's where you've got your controls documented. That's how you can measure whether the controls are being effective. You can report on those controls there. Then there's sort of a separate system, typically, that folks use for records management. So if I need to capture evidence to support my compliance requirement, I'm going to capture it, you know, archive it off, and store it in whatever my records management system is. So that's, that's often a, a separate system in place. Then there's a, another system to do issue escalation and tracking. So if I have an internal audit report that produces a set of findings, I'll load it into an issue tracking system and do management reporting off of that. And that's not related to my evidence tracking system or my control system. This is just for issue tracking. And my system for internal audit issue tracking may be different from my system from security assessment findings and how I track those. So lots of different systems come in there. And then finally, kind of overall management reporting. So who's ever responsible for reporting on cyber risk up to the board of directors probably has their own processes, access databases, Excel spreadsheets to kind of pull this information together. So now there's another dimension on reporting systems that need to be maintained. So while there historically has been some technology enabling the overall process, it's been these very fragmented systems. So <clears throat> what we've seen emerge in the last, uh, just the last few years, I'd say over the last five years, but really coming into uh, more popularity in the last uh, 18 months has been a sort of a new class of ICRM t tools or technologies. <clears throat> um, the marketplace will often talk about these as uh, GRC tools or governance risk and compliance tools and you, know, you can look on any of the kind of major major evaluation sites to get an idea of what some of the leaders are in that space but there's a, there's a number of key leaders there and they really have a phenomenal approach to bring together 
all of these different components into a single integrated package that can really help clients, help corporate, co co corporate companies, help even um, you know, federal institutions address this kind of overwhelming set of requirements they've got to adhere to. Um, and I'll talk about each one of these in a little bit more depth, but it really is the sort of idea of an end-to-end -end system that can maintain my full inventory of compliance requirements, has a lot of the pre-configured information in there, so it sort of comes built in with best practice information, and then it can help folks automate the process as well. And there's a lot of different solutions out here. You know, certainly I'm not recommending or promoting one over the other. Um, I think there's a number of different software vendors out here that have, have gotten this right and have uh, successfully implemented that with a number of different companies. Uh, so the first area I'll drill down to a little bit more is this compliance inventory. Um, we talked about how different business units have sort of different ways of looking at risk, of looking at security. This is an example of really um, how that can be applied to, a, in this case, a utility industry company. So you can see across the top there are several um, functional risk areas. So these are the different high-level areas of risk that a company might be measuring. They're measuring, and again, this is uh, an example in the utility industry, their transmission generation risk, they're measuring credit risk around settlements, uh, security, so cybersecurity risks, environmental risks, supply chain risks, and you know multiple others. So for each of those functional risk areas, we can map them down to a specific division, a specific operating unit. You get down to the department, and really it becomes into the, um, the process or the activity where that I can map specific risks and controls against them. So all of these requirements that we're talking about are associated uh, with mitigating a specific risk, and then we want to identify that risk by um, specific process or specific asset that lives within a business unit. So we're really mapping this entire sort of compliance framework to the business that's responsible for adhering to it. So it's not just I'm PCI compliant, but my uh, you know merchandising department in the U.S. is responsible for this control execution, and my online marketing department in Canada is responsible for you know these requirements here and so able to really identify specific risks and requirements that live within a business unit and then you can assign some of the responsibility of uh, governance that we were talking about earlier as well. <coughs> Second big piece of the technology is that uh, rationalization of the requirements and there's a number of good frameworks out there uh, both uh, both public and proprietary that do a good job at rationalizing these requirements down. And again, this is really the concept of my, my NERC requirement, my FERC requirement, my SOX requirement, they all may require eight character passwords. Well, let's just have a standard control that we define around that then, and we can, can apply that control out to all the different asset types um, that may be under the scope of control for those different regulations, and I have one way to test that now. So my system administrator that manages a SOX server and my system administrator that manages a SCADA server out at, server out at my substation, right? they're implementing that control in the same way and reporting the same evidence back, so it's a very consistent approach. And that's really the last piece of the technology enable is that consistent and efficient processes. So solutions that can help map from those integrated requirements we just talked about through the actual compliance execution. So the workflow to gather the evidence, to do the appropriate review and sign off of that evidence, and then generate risk and compliance reports, handle um, issue tracking and escalation. So really an end-to-end -end solution to identify or to solve a lot of those uh, integrated compliance risk management challenges. So that is the last slide in my ICRM story. Um, I'll pause there to see if there's any comments or questions at all on, uh, on ICRM before we move to our next case study. You know, compliance is a hot topic on a Wednesday afternoon. All right, we can certainly have more at the end of the session, but I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, um, Chad Whitman. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chad Whitman. I'm a uh, Purdue graduate from 2004. Um, I'm a manager based out of uh, Deloitte Chicago office. So today, I'm going to walk through a use case of a cyber incident. Uh, this was a project that I did back in 2010. Um, it's going to be somewhat generic, obviously, with the confidentiality, because this is a real incident. It's going to be somewhat generic, but I'm going to try to hit all the, 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 the good talking points. So, quick overview. Um, we were engaged by a client to assist with the investigation of a, a cyber incident uh, specifically related, related to credit card fraud. Um, so the services that we provided to this client, uh, incident response, triage, and then forensic services. And additionally, uh, once all those were complete, we would generate a report, which would also include uh, additional recommendations as to what they can further do to bolster their environment going forward. Um, so a little bit of background, this is a global organization with over 500 locations worldwide. So they had a very large footprint, both from a, you know, a geographic perspective, they were in over 70 countries, plus um, from an attack vector perspective, they had a, a large attack surface on the internet. And uh, one of the key things to think about as I'm talking through this is that um, when they actually built their network, by design, they chose to have any location be able to talk to one another, essentially a, a large MPLS network with any-to-any -any connectivity. So um, this is before we got to the client, but you know, the first day that we get there, we, we, we uh, meet with the client, we, we figure out what's really going on, give us all the background. So they had told us that a few months prior, there was a large number of lockouts that had occurred in a particular location in Asia Pacific. Um, this happens from time to time. They thought it was just kind of a fluke. Uh, a bunch of people reported to the help desk. The accounts were unlocked. They thought, okay, problem solved. Let's, let's go back to work. So two days later, um, in their Canadian part of their practice, uh, a large number of additional account lockouts were observed. So they kind of started thinking, hey, maybe we have a bigger problem here. So they actually did additional uh, analysis. They had one person that part-time did forensics and incident response stuff in his spare time. Uh, a lot of times companies don't have somebody that can do incident response and forensics on staff. Um, so that's, that's definitely a challenge for a lot of companies because they really don't know what to do. A lot of times they'll start touching stuff and running antivirus scans and that's good from a containment and, and remediation perspective, but when we're trying to do that uh, from a forensic perspective to figure out what happened, a lot of times the antivirus scans and everything like that will start to mess up timestamps and everything like that. So as we're trying to track it back, it becomes very difficult to do that. Um, so as I was saying, they found uh, some password guessing malware on, the, on a machine in the Canadian location. Uh, it was also brute force software, which was causing the account lockouts. So uh, the client decided to take a very drastic step and actually um, completely wipe all of the servers at that location and rebuild that from scratch. Obviously, this was a decision they made. It's very drastic. There's a, a significant business interruption. But this is probably the best way to totally eradicate what could be on the machine because all they knew is what they found. They, they always are not going to know what they don't know. And that's always a big problem in, in forensics. Another thing they did was uh, worldwide throughout all their locations, they asked the local administrators to change passwords, both their domain accounts as well as local uh, administrator accounts on all the different servers. So as you can imagine in a large organization like this, they have thousands upon thousands of servers. Um, so they did ask. The one thing that they did not do was they didn't perform any verification that people actually uh, res reset their passwords. And in a large organization like this, it is somewhat you know, tough to do that. But when I was actually meeting with the client the first day, you know, that immediately right there kind of set off red flags. Because what if they didn't change the passwords on 10 servers, and those 10 servers were the ones that were infected with other pieces of malware? Um, so after they did that, again, they thought back to business as usual. They figured the problem was solved. It was an isolated piece of malware, and they were good to go. So uh, three months later, the client is contacted by their credit card acquirer, which is essentially the middleman in the credit card processing scheme. So the credit card acquirer said, hey, um, we're seeing you as a common point of purchase for fraud, otherwise known as CPP. Essentially, they do a lot of statistical analysis on all the uh, credit card data that's processed through Visa, MasterCard, American Express, etc. And through statistical analysis, they're able to determine where a common point of purchase for fraud is. So a lot of times we see clients, they have no clue they've been breached, and the only way they find out is through Visa, MasterCard, or their credit card acquiring bank actually tells them, hey, you've got a problem. So once the client was alerted, um, that's when we were actually brought aboard. We were doing some other projects for them, and they happened to mention this to us, and we're like, oh, hey, we do this work. So we immediately got on board and started working with them. 
So we took a look at the CPP data that was provided to us. And what we did is we basically did a very quick risk assessment to figure out what is the top locations that we should look at first. Essentially, what has the most fraud? So after we did that, um, we, we used some forensic software like NCASE Enterprise, for example, which is, allows us to remotely over a network actually uh, examine the systems remotely. So we did some very quick uh, triage, and uh, after discussing with the client, we determined that uh, we actually needed to go on site to review uh, all the data. And this was actually in Europe, so basically we got on a plane the next day. So we get to Europe, you know, we're trying to adjust. We start to look at the systems for malware. Um, I'd say I think it was about 12 hours after we were on the ground and started, we probably had four people there. Uh, 12 hours after we got on the ground, we actually uh, found a few pieces of malware. So the first piece of malware that we found, um, what it did was essentially it dumped memory from a point of sale server. And if you're not familiar with the point of sale server, is anytime you go to a restaurant, they type in your order and that's what they swipe your credit card with. So the first piece of malware dumped the memory from the credit card point of sale server. And what it did is it put it in a specific folder buried deep within the Windows file system, something you would never normally look at in the first place. The second piece of malware, every five seconds, it would look at that particular directory. It would run a regular expression looking for credit card numbers as well as track two data. And track two data is what's located on the back of your credit card on the magnetic stripe. For, for cyber criminals, that's gold right there because with that track two data, that's how they can actually recreate a credit card and go to a store like Home Depot and just swipe the card and actually buy it. That, that goes on the underground market. A track two data enabled credit card goes for a lot more versus just a standard credit card. Um, so once the data was found, or I'm sorry, once the second piece of malware uh, found credit cards within the, uh, the memory dumps, what it would do was actually write it to a file. Um, this file, again, was buried very deep within the uh, Windows file system, and it had a different directory other than .txt, for example. I, I believe it was .chm, which is a Windows help file. So if you're just casually looking, hey, it's a Windows help file. Let's ignore it. And that's what they try to do. They try to bury it very, very deep so no one finds it. Um, so it puts it in that file. Then what we found after doing some uh, log analysis with the firewalls that were located at this site, this site actually happened to have firewall logging turned on very high, which was good. And I'll talk more in a minute about some of the other sites we visited. It was the exact opposite. They almost had no logging whatsoever. So from a forensic perspective, it's very hard to do our job when there's no logs to actually go back and try to track what's happening. Um, so what we found is, in looking through the logs, is that they were actually sending the data via FTP. We could actually see the, the put command with the file name, so we had 100% conf uh, confidence that this was actually being pushed out via FTP. The other thing I'll mention is that there could be unknown methods of data exfiltration that we're just not aware of. Um, we only had limited amount of log files, so I always kind of caveat that. We only knew about the, the FTP uh, exfiltration at one particular site. Uh, our working theory was that this was also happening at other sites, but again, because there was no log data, we couldn't actually prove that. Um, the other thing to mention is that uh, this piece of malware was specifically targeted to this particular point of sale vendor. Um, over the last few years, the food, food uh, hospitality, those industries have been targeted very heavily. Now it's kind of moving towards other areas, and I'm sure you guys hear APT all the time. I, I don't know if I would necessarily call this APT, but this was definitely a targeted attack. So um, as we were doing our investigation, we found these pieces of malware on the point of sale servers. We also started looking at the surrounding infrastructure, the Active Directory domains, et cetera. And what we actually found was that um, in Windows XP, Windows 7, et cetera, you hit Control, Alt, Delete to log into your computer. You type in your username and password, and you log in. What, what actually controls that behind the scenes is something called the Graphical Identification Authentication Library. It's, um, essentially, it's called the Gina Library. So what, another piece that we found was that uh, whoever these bad guys were, they basically replaced the, the normal Microsoft Gina file with another one of theirs. And uh, we found three different variants of this Gina replacement file. The first one actually just uh, wrote the username and password to a local file, which we theorized that later on, since they already had persistent access into the network somehow, they would just come back and pick up whenever they felt like it. Uh, the second one actually emailed it directly via uh, SMTP on an open SMTP port. Um, security best practice tells us that we should not open up ports that we don't need for business purposes, especially SMTP or email ports. Um, if the client had taken a simple approach of either not allowing it altogether 
or just allowing your email servers to send SNTP, you know, this would have been a significantly less problem. Uh, the third variant we found was actually sending uh, the credentials to a, a third party website. So as a result of this particular attack, um, the bad guys or whoever it was, uh, they were able to gain a significant number of privileged accounts. So that's local administrators, domain administrators, um, system administrators that log in to do things for work every single day. They had over 25 of those accounts for a global organization. So that's, I mean, they're pretty much owned at that point. Um, it was, it was kind of scary. So the way that the malware was spread, so as we were doing our forensic analysis, you know, we find the malware, and then we start looking a little bit deeper to figure out, hey, how did this happen? We start looking through log files, stuff like that. So one of the ways that they were actually uh, sending the different five pieces of malware through the network was using a legitimate system administrator tool called uh, PSExec. It's part of the Windows Sys internal suite. This is a legitimate tool. It, you know, I use it all the time for legitimate things. The problem is, is that you can use legitimate things for illegitimate activities. So um, the other big thing is that uh, Windows file sharing ports, that's how they also uh, propagated the, the malware throughout the network. And unfortunately, in a Windows environment, that's almost required to have all the computers talk to one another. So you know, there's not a whole lot we can do. But that's kind of how we found that the uh, malware was spread throughout this investigation. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, Whoever was doing this, they had been in the network for quite some time. They had actually started uh, capturing all the, ma uh, the credentials using the genome replacement that I was speaking about earlier. So they had the privileged accounts. They were in the network for quite some time. And um, we actually discovered scripts on some of the servers that they were kind of using as a, a jump server, as a point of attack for the rest of the network to, to springboard. Um, and what we were seeing is that they had already determined the uh, client's server naming scheme. They had determined the IP addressing scheme. So, for example, this client, uh, the dot two of the first subnet, for example, was always a certain type of server. Um, so they were basically able to write scripts using PSExec. It's, just, it's actually a simple bash script that uses PSExec to send the malware to those machines that they know have a vulnerability that they're actively exploiting. So they were able to uh, rapidly infect the entire network using this very simple uh, methodology. So moving on to remediation and cleanup. Throughout all of our forensic analysis, we have a continued running list um, indicators of compromise. I know Mandy has kind of coined that term, so I just kind of borrowed it from them. So as we're going through it, the, the indicators of compromise essentially are uh, hash values, uh, registry keys, file names that we've known, we've figured out that are actually bad pieces of malware. So we just keep a running list. So what we do with those is we, we kind of plug those into our different forensic tools, such as NCASE Enterprise. We use uh, custom scripts that we wrote, as well as human interaction. So some of the locations had uh, very little bandwidth connectivity, so we couldn't actually run our tools. So basically, we would have to email a Word file to, to a system administrator and say, hey, check this, this, and this, and let us know what you find. So after we did a sweep of the environment, uh, we found a, quite a few additional compromised sites. The credit card data showed that there was at least three sites. I believe through the additional work that we helped this client with, they found another 15 that they had no clue about. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty alarming. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this client took a very drastic step to, anytime there's a compromised site, wipe clean and start from scratch. And personally, if, if the business interruption isn't too bad, or you know, the client thinks that's the best approach, I'm all for that, because you never know what you might, let me rephrase that. There's always something you're not going to know about. So it's better to start from scratch. Uh, the other thing we did is we actually conducted a global review of all the firewalls. So at over 500 locations, they have a large attack surface on the internet. Uh, by policy, th uh, these firewalls were only supposed to be for outbound internet browsing. But through our, through our audit of these firewalls, we actually found that there was at least 10 or so that were allowing inbound traffic. Essentially, they were hosting a website when they weren't supposed to. So that's additional entry points into the network that didn't have the other types of security controls, intrusion detection, prevention, uh, firewalls, et cetera. So that's another thing that uh, definitely to look out for. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we developed the, the indicators of compromise. Um, we, did, we did do a lot, a lot of log analysis. I didn't cover it too much today. But the one thing that we helped this client with, they had an existing uh, logging platform. And what we did was essentially did an enhancement of it. So we took raw data out of it, 
we wrote some custom scripts and based on the traffic patterns that we were seeing from the log analysis, we basically wrote some customized scripts that would parse the firewall log data as it came in and basically whenever it hit a certain pattern, it would send an email alert in near real time to a system administrator so that they could then go investigate it further. Um, we tried to tune it and reduce the false positives as much as possible because there was a very specific traffic pattern that we found. So um, I would actually spoken with a client about six months after we were there and they said through the additional enhanced reporting that we created for them, they were able to find two additional sites. So they basically brought their detection time down from months to hours which, in my opinion, that's a very big win. Uh, lessons learned. As I was just talking about logging, um, most organizations we, we go to have some sort of log management solution. Um, I find that most clients have a solution, and that's about it. They have a lot of log data being sent to those, those logging platforms, but because of resource constraints, they just don't have anyone looking at it. I mean, in this particular example, a lot of the log data that we found you know, afterwards, in hindsight, they would have been able to find this within hours if they were actually uh, actively looking at their log files. They didn't even have to be looking for something specific. You know, We looked through intrusion detection logs. We found that there was um, vulnerability scans happening from sources where it shouldn't happen. So those are red flags that they would have seen right away if they had been looking at their logs. And again, uh, a lot of clients, unfortunately, don't look at their logs. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning in the overview, the any to any connectivity that they built in by design kind of bit them in the butt after this. Uh, I'm a big proponent of recommending network segmentation, so essentially restricting what the business, what parts of the business can talk to one another. Because if they had implemented proper network segmentation, you know, this problem might have been, do, been reduced by 75%, 50%, etc. Uh, but the way they had it, you could go anywhere in their organization. It was a, a very, very flat network. So I would mention to any business or, you know, if in your future employment um, areas, if you see any, any connectivity, make sure you do a thorough risk assessment to make sure that you've actually covered all the, all the different areas and make sure that the, the reward is, is worth the risk. Um, another big thing, create and implement standard configurations for all your devices. This is something that's pretty simple. I'm kind of probably preaching to the choir here. But again, a lot of our clients don't do this. Um, they may have a standard image, for example, in America, but Europe, Asia, Latin America, you're on your own. Um, you think they could just easily send it over and you know they could make modifications as regionally appropriate, but I find that a lot of clients just don't do that. Same thing goes with network gear. Um, a lot of that can be scripted. It can be done very fast, very easy, very automated fashion. Uh, again, just don't see a lot of clients doing that, unfortunately. Um, I'd already mentioned uh, properly segmenting networks, so I'll kind of skip over that one. Um, the next one, so applications today, especially point of sale servers, they're considered PCI compliant, which means that they go through an accreditation process by the, the Payment Card Industry Council. They get their code audited by a third party independent auditor. Um, that being said, you can have a PCI compliant application that is still vulnerable. So just because something's PCI compliant, you need to put in additional security controls. You can't just, you know, basically trust it. Oh, hey, it's PCI compliant. Let's just put it in this corner and not worry about it again. Because unfortunately, uh, a lot of our clients think that PCI compliant means security, which, you know, Sharon alluded to earlier, and that's definitely not the case. Um, when, when we're actually on site the first day trying to do incident response, one of the big things that we usually can't seem to get very fast is network and system documentation to basically show how does, how, does your, how does your network look? Because when we're first coming into an organization, we really have no knowledge of how things are laid out. So we need to be able to quickly grasp and figure out, hey, here's firewalls here, here's internet connections, so on and so forth, so we can figure out the best containment methods, et cetera, as well as places to potentially look uh, going forward. So with that, I think I'm done. Uh, any questions for, for myself or Sharon? Joel? Was, uh, was the client able to, at the end, uh, put a monetary value on the cost of the breach to them, uh, whether it be uh, loss of data or uh, downtime? It was, uh, it was uh, under $10 million. I'd say, excuse me, I believe it was between 7 and $10 million. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not asking for any specific names, but were you able to track back and figure out who the bad guys were? 
I specifically was not. Uh, we did work with uh, three-letter agencies, and that's pretty much all I can say. Sure. Yes? So my question is, uh, why is your client called you instead of local law enforcement agencies? Uh, a lot of clients we find don't, don't have any relationship with any sort of uh, uh, law enforcement. Like, you can't just call your local police department. They're not going to know what to do. Uh, most companies don't have a, an ongoing relationship with the FBI, CIA, et cetera, where they can say, hey, you know, we see a problem. I will say that a lot of times, uh, you know, like especially the Secret Service, they do quite a bit of work around cybercrime as well. They will actually approach companies when they find data in the underground environment, and they'll, they'll actually call, most, most times they'll call legal counsel first, and they'll say, hey, we're, we're seeing this data out in the open. You guys probably have a problem. You should start looking. Any other questions? Are these type of problems rare or common in your practice? Uh, common. Very, very common. Um, as Sharon mentioned earlier, with that one headline slide, we could probably do that almost every single day. And a lot of times, you won't ever hear about them in the public. That, that's the thing. There, there's a lot out there that's just never in the public eye. So. Yes? So just to, <clears throat> just to clarify... We can't hear you. Okay. So just to clarify um, the attacks that you found that were actually conducted uh, uh, via websites or also via those point of whatever, you know... So I, I'm mentioning this because I, I actually had two cards compromised and one of them I am... <laughs> 100% sure I have never used it online. So right. if the information was stolen, was it a store or restaurant? I can't tell the exact industry that it was in. Uh huh. Um, obviously, because it comes No, so I'm, I'm curious more of the, you know, was it a, a internet, uh, uh, you know, path or was it? It was an internal path. So they actually had remote access into this client's network somehow. We were never able to figure out how. Okay, so it, so basically they they got uh, they got access to their servers then yeah. for they whatever reason they had credit cards stored somewhere in that system. Yeah, I mean the client had legitimate purposes for using credit cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, like I said, this was actually a PCI compliant piece of point of sale software. The problem is. Um, the credit cards are not encrypted within memory when the application is processing it. So by uh, dumping memory, they're able to get the cards in clear text as well as attract two data. So yeah. that's how they're able to do it. And, and the other thing that I wanted to clarify was when you mentioned that by getting that track two, they actually can create cards. Right. And so that, that explains why. In my case, actually, that's what happened. They had the cards, and I was like, it can, could not have been me because I'm, on, you know, I'm right. in Indiana, and somebody's buying stuff in Texas, and... Okay. Yeah, no, I've had my corporate credit card unfortunately compromised numerous times where somebody will go to Home Depot in, you know, like Florida, and I live in Chicago, and they buy $1,000 worth of something. I see my credit card. I'm like, oh, great, here we go again. And unfortunately, in today's times, that's just kind of what we have to deal with. Yeah, and that kind of information, this track to, are they required to store that? Or, or is just like, so why are, would they store something so like that? Do they, they need to? Or? They don't actually store track to. It's prohibited by the PCI oh, standards. Oh, but as they're swiping. Yeah, as they're swiping it in, the application, did, may, basically they'll get a cheaper uh, rate if they get the track to data because that means actually the card is present. Yes, yes, yes. So by, by the PCI standard, they're actually not allowed to store it. Okay. And I have, in the last couple of years, I have not seen clients actually storing it, which is very good. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any truth to some of the charges that some people, they claim that maybe some of these IT companies, and they have true third uh, persons, they do something so that they sell some products. It reminds me of that Charlie Chaplin movie. There was a kid who was paid. He broke some glasses with a slingshot, and there was a window repairman who was coming a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that? And if there is... Has there been any investigation, and if there is any statistics about that? I, I apologize. I didn't get the whole question. I'm sorry. I said if there is any uh, truth to some people who charge that some of these IT security companies, uh -huh. through third parties, they create some problems so they can sell some products. Oh, so, okay, I gotcha. I mean, obviously, Deloitte would never do anything like that. And I can't imagine any other type of information security professional doing that either. But, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm sure it may happen somewhere. Um, I've seen, actually there's a case in the news where uh, Marriott Hotels, 
uh, they work with the Secret Service where somebody essentially claimed to hack into Marriott's systems and he had the audacity to email them and said, I will not release this information if you give me a job. So he actually agreed to fly from somewhere in Europe to the U.S. and, and Secret Service was actually uh, you know, posing <coughs> as the, the Marriott employee that they were dealing with. And he actually flew to America, got arrested as soon as he got to the airport. So, I mean, it's not exactly what you're talking about, it was something very similar. Any other questions? Great, well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, here's our contact information. <laughs>